Okay, folks, you listen to a Shadow Channel podcast. My name is Lewis Hamilton. I'm joined today by a friend of mine, Ross Hepburn, stand-up comedian. How are you? Hello. How are you doing, Lewis? You good? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, we're here in the Blind Port, and we were here three years ago, I something think. Else. It was, uh, yeah, it was something like three years ago. Has it been that long? Maybe two and a half years. Jesus you were last on the show Christ. September 2013, and you were first on the show, I think, in September, September 2012. 2012. Yeah. So it's oh. good to have you back. Yeah, it's well, uh, you, you pay me well. That's why I'm here, I suppose, you know? Yeah, yeah you're, you're one of my favorite podcasting guests, frankly. Because as we were just talking before the show, we're talking about how people are on the microphone. And you, you naturally, you're natural. Yeah. Right? You, you, don't need, uh, you don't need help. And, and, and how do you feel? I mean, do you, you, were, you were saying, I mean, you're often speaking down a microphone to a crowd being a stand-up comic. Yeah, well, you sort of pick up a few things that's basic about a microphone. You naturalize and, and it. And, like, you know, you know how you're going to sound for it, so you might as well... Not really utilize your voice to the best advantage, just sound how you're going to sound and go with it. That's the best way that you can really work a microphone, I suppose, you Mm -hmm. know, over than say, going, Hello, my name is Andy, and I work in. No, man, come on, just Mm. talk how you're going to talk, you know. And it's it's almost like a. I hate to use a woman as an example, but it's almost. or, Or a man, depending on your persuasion. So you, you're delicate with it. A lot of people, when they first use microphones, are very harsh. Yeah. And it's almost like there's a certain fear between it, but you almost, you become so delicate that you pretend it's not there. It just yeah. becomes an extension of the conversation, and that's, that's why I love having you on the show. Ah, well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here again. Mm-hmm. So what have you been up to recently? Uh, I have been planning my first ever solo stand-up show. That's awesome. Tell me. Yeah, it's... Yeah. it's coming along really good yeah. been just getting that sorted and stuff and the thing that really interests me about uh, the show that you have coming up over I think the next month it's going to be April the 2nd it'll be at April the 2nd uh, 2015 and what is that a Saturday or a it's Friday? a Thursday it's a Thursday that's a good day of the week yeah could be worse than a Thursday a Tuesday for example Ugh. I like Tuesdays I've never been a big fan of Tuesdays um it's a it's a themed show would you call it a themed show would you call it's, it a, it's themed yeah. it is themed uh I like writing in themes, and yeah. uh, I think it's important for it, no matter what writer you are. If there's a theme that you're going with, you, and you yeah. stick at it, it's kind of it will help your writing mm. along in certain ways. Mm. And um, you know, it's 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 somewhat themed. It is based on two films that relatively have the same thing in it: ghosts, mm-hmm. and it's two stand-up comedians talking about those films. Mm. So there's a bit of a theme going on. Um, are they both '80s films as well? With, uh, yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. they are because because well, uh, Beetlejuice, which is your segment of this show, yeah. That was 89? That was 88, yeah. 88? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Ghostbusters was 84. 84, of course, yeah. yeah. And it's they were, There's something great about film in the 80s, particularly horror and quasi-horror. You know, a spook. I like to call it spook. I don't know. Spook should be a, a genre unto itself because there's that line between... I don't like gratuitous... Uh, violence and they've been a big fan of the Saw films but no. even horror films from the 80s things like Beetlejuice and if you think about it Ghostbusters if you think about the, the supernatural I'm, element you don't associate them with horror films in your head that's almost like a veneer on the top I don't know about that because I've never been one to sort of um, call Beetlejuice a horror film like I always defend it when uh, you know it's a sort of satire of horror if you will mm. if you look at it because you know that when the, you, you first see the ghosts and you see the humans interacting them they, are, they do just ignore them because you wouldn't you would be like fuck was that doesn't matter you know like yeah. uh, you just bang past it you'd have to be really surprised by something completely out of the ordinary for you to be terrified of that mm-hmm. and that's why I think Beetle- that's the satire that I think that comes across in Beetlejuice um, but Ghostbusters that's just straight all and out comedy mm. you know there's there's jokes in there there's you know catchphrases there's sarcasm there's Bill Murray doing his best routine there's Dan Aykroyd doing his best mm. uh, so I think uh, at the time, the 80s had this thing. The 80s was the best decade because movies at that point were big. No matter what sort of film it was, it was going to be a big film because it, there was exciting in the 80s. There was new cutting-edge ways of doing films nowadays and there was these new film stars and new writing ideas that were coming out. Yeah. So I would say, I wouldn't, I would never call Beetlejuice or Ghostbusters horror films in any regard. I would say, I would say they're spook-centric. Because they're they're, they're light hearted yeah. they're light hearted spooky things. Well, know? in all honesty, there's still those scenes in uh, Ghostbusters, for example, where the possession is taking place, and and the bad guy, the demon, the, the spirit demon himself, whose name I forget. What's his Gozer name? Gozer the Gozerian. Gozer the Gozerian. Yes. I've, I mean, uh, I was the opening act for days for his Ghostbusters show during the Fringe, and for ten performances, I learned every single goddamn thing you need to know about Ghostbusters. About Ghostbusters. If you've seen that over and over again, I saw it once yeah. last year at the festival. Des O'Gorman, by the way. 
Um, and it was a great show, but it was so informative. Yeah. Uh, there's clearly been a huge amount of effort. Now, your your segment of the science fiction double feature, which is the official name that is yeah. being given to the, the show, for one thing, um, is it along the same lines? Does it have the same structure as Dez's? Is it the same thing, but it's Ghostbuster? Uh, sorry, but it's uh, Beetlejuice? Or have you gone for a different approach in the way that you're going to do the feature? There is certain similarities between me and Dez's show. Uh, for one thing, we're both just having... Uh, talks about our films and why they mean so much to us but realistically it's completely different to Dez's in terms of uh, with Dez's show his was a tribute because it was the 30th anniversary of Ghostbusters when it came out so he wanted to do a show praising how great it was and he praised the writing he praised the special effects and he praised the cast and um, you know the jokes in there were all sent where you would laugh at how they got away with it and that was a tribute to it and it had a beautiful ending in which he praised Harold Ramis for calling him his hero and things like that and it's something like that whereas with mine with Beetlejuice as the writer that I am I like to write stuff that's pretty personal to me write stuff that's on my mind and so what I wanted to do was, was instead of really pinpoint everything that's good about Beetlejuice I thought I'd talk about how Beetlejuice has pretty much played a part in my life mm. and how it sort of became there's certain moments of my life where I've always gone back to Beetlejuice for and ultimately it, will, it sort of talks about how it ultimately became my favourite film ever made mm. I've seen thousands of films but Beetlejuice is still my all time and it's favorite Burton film. it's Tim Burton right? yeah it's Tim Burton's yeah. creation it's his baby mm -hmm. it's just, we were saying actually a few minutes ago about that kind of line in the 80s where horror and comedy and you were saying that yeah. Ghostbusters is a good example it's like a comedy film but it has very I'd say dark elements it's almost like the movie wants to be dark but the actors are refusing to allow it to be dark yeah. and um, maybe maybe my view of Beetlejuice in my head as a as a quasi horror spooky film is just Tim Burton's style yeah. everything Tim Burton makes I mean he made Batman and yes. he made it slightly spooky well he and didn't make it slightly yeah. spooky he just made it dark yeah, uh, I'm a huge Tim Burton fan. I've, uh, he, he's my hero. Mm. Like I've often said that before, that he is my hero. He's made, he's pretty, he's, he's responsible for my all-time favorite film. And the films that he's made, I've always been mm. hugely um, inspired by, and just loved mm. how he's done it because he's got this great edge of combining like his love for the gothic fantasy, yeah, with mainstream cinema tropes. And through that, he gets a good visual eye. He gets a good, great sense of humor, mm. and he's able to take you into a reality of film that you've never seen before mm. and in terms of Beetlejuice he was able to combine this great spooky ghost st story-esque style fantasy with this idea of ah it won't be so bad yeah and he made it enjoyable and that's why you mm. know you don't get as frightened in it as you would mm. say anything else you've ever yeah, seen yeah because his films have always struck me as like it's almost like the theme in his head not even so much the visual theme although in some places the visual theme the Batman's films for example yeah. it's almost like they're film noir in a yeah. way that kind of black and white feel but they're also very vibrantly coloured yeah. so if you watch Alice in Wonderland it's bright colours it's gorgeous, you know? gorgeous I love how he combines really dark uh, like tropes that you would find in it with incredibly harsh colours because it really does it's, it does suspend your realities of it yeah. like you go this is a really dark and great things but you mm. get this beautiful gorgeous skyline yeah. in the back you're just like wow well, he really he, yeah. he does do good stuff for the visual eye and uh, it, you know you've got Batman he's all black the only mm. thing that he's got in him that's yellow is the Batman symbol mm. and then you've got the Joker who's so vibrant and mm. purple yeah, well, he, one of the films people make fun of is Batman and Robin. Yeah, which he never I done can that. watch exactly. Yeah. But the, the the director that did that, Joel Schumacher, you can tell that he tried to use the same style because yeah. it's very much the same style. It's sort of these. It's a little bit more flashy though, where you've got these sort of you know that 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 shot of uh, Batman as he turns his torso. Yeah. And you see the bat, bat symbol. Nipples, yeah. You can tell, uh, especially when you look at, but it's more comic booky, obviously. Yeah. Um, you can tell that he was continuing in that vein, but the thing about Batman and Robin is that there's less of that, but it's all color vibrance. Whereas the first one that had, uh, the, I think the Riddler was, was... Well, Batman Forever had the Riddler. Yes, and then uh, Batman and Robin obviously had um, Dr. Had Freeze or Mr. Mr. Freeze, Freeze. Mr. Freeze. And Poison Ivy. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, people slagged that film off because they, they said that was the one that wrecked the franchise and the, one that Burton, the ones that Burton did were great. Yeah. Um, but the... Um, the vibrance of that is almost like they overdid it and people say it's terrible but I can watch that though I can watch Batman and Robin and find it entertaining because every single line in that film is a one-liner 
They're all independent one-liners slung together as a script. And they're terrible. Yeah, they're, and you're trying to good. think of how many analogies Schwarzenegger can use for ice. It's great. And his whole <laughs> script was nothing but <laughs> ice puns. Yeah. Nothing I but it was ice great. puns. I thought it was like, it was almost like someone said, oh, I've got $200 million, let's just sink it let's on this. Let's just waste it. Let's just yeah. pour it down the drain and but turn the, the script century, I mean, there's, there's more elegant examples, almost more elegant examples of the Tim Burton style where people have fucked around with it a little bit. Uh, Sin City, for example, very dark, though. I mean, uh, that really is a dark film, but they use that noir with color. They uh, use less of it. It's almost well, like an art student trying to re-envision. Have, have you read the books? Uh, no. That's no, I have what not. the books actually look like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they weren't... That, that, I wouldn't say that was any Tim Burton-esque inspired style. Yeah. Uh, that was purely Robert Rodriguez going, let's make it like the book, and then Frank Milligan involved. The closest thing I could ever say that really had a sort of Burton-esque style about it is um, any of the animations that was made by Leica. Mm. Like, so Coraline would be one, or Paranorman would be one. Right, I'm not very familiar with that stuff. Well, I'm a yeah. massive cartoon I'm very nerd. interested in um, the influence that someone, anyone that creates something, whether they're a photographer or they're a filmmaker, the influence that they have... Uh, or a musician on other musicians, photographers, filmmakers. So I would look at stuff and go, how much has this been influenced by, you know, this guy or yeah. this girl? Yeah. And um, so I was always very interested in, in, in Sin City. But yeah, of course, Frank Miller probably wrote the graphic novels yeah. like that. And What's he the British guy that wrote V for Vendetta? That uh, was uh, uh, Alan Moore. Very odd looking guy. Yeah, but he, he hates to. any single one of his adaptations. He hates yeah. them all. He would rather have them as books than films any day. And he, I can respect him on that front. Yes. He's a fantastic writer. Um, but, you know, like, I can see why he hates Hollywood for its films, yeah. I suppose. So know? this uh, science fiction double feature that you and Dez have on the go. Mm -hmm. Dez is going to be largely what he did last year. Is he, he's probably making alterations to it, but are yeah. they going to be back-to-back -back with a small break in between? Yeah, that's the plan. And how We're, long is the total running time of all the shows? For uh, well, for me and Dez, he's got a 55-minute show. Yes. Because that's how his show was written out and laid out. Mine's is 45 minutes exactly, mm -hmm. uh, with a few added things that I'm putting in between it. Um... It's gonna like Dez's one's gonna be first because he's the one that he's most confident with for doing it mm -hmm. first because he knows how to do it. Exactly, he's done a hundred yeah. times. And are you following in his vein? Uh, you, you've got a Beetlejuice outfit. Yes, I do. Yeah. And how 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 much are you jumping in the character? You're gonna have some makeup done? No, no. no? I feel uh, a lot of people have been coming up to me a lot ever since I uh, announced that I was doing the Beetlejuice show. And when they found out that I bought the outfit, they said, mm. "Are you gonna are you gonna paint your face up like him? Are you gonna do your yeah. hair like him and stuff like that?" And I said, "No, I'm not," mm. uh, because I feel as though it would detract from the stories. Yeah. And the sense you like, do you want know. it to be Ross Hepburn. Yeah. Well, you. you don't yeah. want it to be a, a Ross Hepburn, the Beetlejuice uh, yeah. lookalike. Yeah. I, I want it to be like Ross Hepburn as Beetlejuice telling his stories. I want yes. to be Ross Hepburn dressed up as Beetlejuice telling yeah. the stories. Because that that's the with. personal aspect. Because a lot of your jokes, I could be wrong about this. Uh, a lot of your jokes are personal anecdotes. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And um, and I think you know, I I've never liked the style. I mean, your style of comedy, I, I like because I've never liked the other styles. One of which is the kind of Peter K style where he yeah. tells these really bizarre, abstract but not abstract jokes See about like about like how paninis are difficult to eat and yeah. you're like what well, the fuck am I listening to a lot of my humour is abstract but like you know I try to keep it grounded to the material that I'm writing it to yeah but you right. know what I mean he has all these jokes about everyday life and yeah. you're just like oh but that's that's his thing though that he's yeah. made an entire career of it yeah. I prefer I prefer believe it or not his uh, direction and written work like um, Talladega, uh, not Talladega Nights Phoenix Nights Phoenix Nights Talladega uh, Nights wasn't Talladega Nights uh, Will Ferrell yeah that was a race film yeah it was <laughs> that was very funny but, good uh, film yeah no, uh, I love I love Phoenix Knights. I love his uh, Max and Paddy's Road to Nowhere. I like the. I think he could, if he was to say I'm going to write a comedy in Britain and mm. make a comedy film about it, he could be like the Mike Lee of comedy films. Well, I was shocked when I found out that Charlie Brooker wrote um, Black Mirror. Yeah, he's a fantastic writer. I, I was like Charlie Brooker. Charlie yeah. Brooker, Weekly Wipe. He, th this. Yeah. I, I mean, I know he's immensely talented, but I didn't think he had it in him to. To, it's, I mean, it's the ultimate example of him, of someone playing it straight. I mean, yeah. he isn't playing it, but he's writing it, but amazing. Yeah. you, you got to respect writers that can write outside their amazing, field. Like, yeah. they're, they, uh, people found it weird when Woody Allen started making serious films after his massive run of comedies, but there was something about him that they still found appealing. Yeah. Now he's gone back to make comedies again. Yeah. That, that's How what old he does, is he now? He must be in his 80s. Oh, he's, he's still he's in his 70s. Yeah, like of course, the passing of uh, Leonard Nimoy recently. Are you a big Star Trek fan? I was brought up on Star Trek. Yeah. I'm a bit of a fan. Uh, What's your favourite series? I mean, do you, do you like the original series more yeah, than the others? No, uh, I'm not I'm not any particular mm. massive uh, Trekkie of any kind. Mm. Uh, obviously, the original William Shatner, George yeah. Decades, uh, was what I was brought up on. But Next Generation is kind of the staple of Yeah, yeah, everything. well, it was Patrick Stewart. 
Yeah. You know, like Patrick Sure Shakespearean actor great at actor. the helm of the USS Enterprise, you know. And like, you know, it, that, they're all good shows. I've got I don't I don't differ anyone from the last. They're yeah. all really well written and well acted yeah. shows. So I'm just happy to watch Star Trek and go this is good. Uh, yeah. I, I think out of the films, Wrath of Khan two is the best. Mm. Like, what did you think of Into Darkness? Because like, Into Darkness was kind of a remake of Wrath of Khan. Yeah, I like it. In a way. I like that. Um, but Cumberbatch played that, that role fantastically. He's just a great does. actor. Mm. Like, you could you could give him a part in the back of a napkin and he'd be good at it. Yeah. He was one of those guys didn't come at the fore for a long time. He's a bit no. like George R. R. Martin. Wasn't recognized till he was in his, I think, late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. Uh, and I think new Game of Thrones is out, mo- out next month. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely... The, you know, influences are very important. Yeah. And uh, for you, you, I remember you telling me two years ago, th- two and a half years ago, yeah. when you were first, we were sitting right where we're sitting right now. Yeah. And you were telling me that Woody Allen was a massive uh, influence and that you would even write your jokes on yellow paper. Yes. Uh, see, I do remember that. Um, just like Woody Allen. And, yeah. and it's these strange kind of creature comforts in, in the art of what you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, aside from Allen, who would you say? Oh, man, there's hundreds. Uh, uh, Andrew O'Neill mm-hmm. was the guy that made me want to do it mm. uh, I saw him when I was 18 years old in the Tron for a fiver and he was doing the style of comedy that I wanted to do he wasn't going up on stage doing the observationalist or being a storyteller he was just talking about himself and make and just showing how he thought about things and that was the funniest thing I ever heard yeah uh, Woody Allen's number two obviously then you've got people like say Louis CK Patrice O'Neill Mike Wilmot um, and then you've got like Paul Joey Ka- Diaz <laughs> Uh, Paul Curry. Yeah. Like uh, uh, my perceptions of stand up has been cha- has changed a lot more ever yeah. since I did the club circuit. Like I'm not I don't look at people like Lee Evans. Uh, I still love his work. I, I, like mm. he's my second favorite comedian in terms of comedy, but like mm. Uh, I don't try. I don't want to aim for like mm. the star, like the making. One of the things games. you share in common with the Evans is you're very, you're very physical. Yeah, as a comedian, I love. I like. Mm. I like giving energy. Yeah. I like, it's like Jack D is very reserved. Doesn't move much. Doesn't use that, his hands that, much. That shits his material though, yeah. because his his material is him complaining. Exactly. So it would yeah. be weird for him to be complaining in a sort of angry fit way. Mm. Uh, much like another big influence of mine, Phil Nickel. He did the show called Rants, and for it, he was just screaming and bawling about how much he hated yeah. all these things. It's hilarious and it helped the material, you know. Mm. But in reality, uh, Phil Nichols is a really calm and collective guy. Yeah, like he's a uh, he takes it easy, you know. Like off stage, he, he he's an actor as well, mm. as well and a musician. So comedy is just like you know, like there's a bit of something that just gives him a yeah. way to do. But, so uh, with regard to this science fiction double feature, as a kind of shout out to people that want to come and see it, where is it going to be? How many nights is it going to be on? Uh, what's the price? Uh, those kind of details uh, right. because you definitely want to get people through the door and I totally, no doubt totally. there will be and, uh, plenty of people coming through the door well yeah like uh, so the science fiction double feature is two stand up shows back to back you've got me and my good friend Dizzle Gorman on the bill uh, it's two pound on the door it's at Banshee's Labyrinth in the chamber room downstairs and the show will be starting at half seven and finishing at half ten Banshee uh, Labyrinth can I just say as a choice for a venue for that particular show uh, the science fiction double feature yeah. which I mean I think science fiction, I mean, I'd say it applies to Ghostbusters more than it applies to Beetlejuice no, as no. a term. Oh, oh, science I, fiction. You know, you associate, we're just talking about Star Trek. I don't know, yeah, I don't know if you would just use the uh, the Tim Burton esque kind of thing, this kind of, this gothic style, this, you know. But uh, yeah, they're very, uh, I, I think science fiction works for, for lack of the poverty of the English language. They call yeah. it a dark double feature or something well, like that. Maybe that, I, no, that's too vague. So. It's, it's, it was too vague. Like, when I had the idea to do this show, mm. like, my initial idea was, I was, like I told you, I was opening for days. Yeah. And there was one night we were finishing up and I just had the idea uh, I thought about it for two days I went Des do you think I could write an entire show based on Beetlejuice yeah like how you did it on Ghostbusters he said why not give it a go so I started talking to other people about it people in the industry who I respect mm-hmm. and they went this sounds like a great idea why don't you give it a go you could put like you've got that market there and I thought about it for a while and the idea like the idea was just sitting there and I was starting thinking about it and then before I started writing it I was already thinking about the title for the show I like to think about the titles first mm. just so I know where to get the layer from and I thought about how about if me and Des did two both of these shows back to back as a comedy night this would be a great night for something and the titles were just sort of coming to me and like I was trying thinking you know spooktacular this and like anything that had ghost in the title mm. I got, and then I thought and then I saw like someone in the room like a B movie thing and I just thought oh 
how about the science fiction double feature? Because it goes back to that idea of when you go to a cinema. Like uh, my dad told me about how you went to the cinema and like you would go see these double feature showings, mm. and you'd get things like you know you'd get a comedy double feature, you'd get a science, you know you'd get a, a drama double feature, you'd get a, a horror double feature and stuff like that. And then he said the phrase the science fiction double feature, and there's just something about it that just it rings mm. and it resonates. You're like, ooh, I like that science fiction yeah. double feature. So. We called it the Science Fiction Double Feature after that. Funny story, because after we announced that the show was called the Science Fiction Double Feature, people came up to me and they said, is it Rocky Horror themed? And I, <laughs> and I went, no. And they went, really? I went, yes, why? Because there's a song that's in Rocky Horror called Science Fiction Double Feature. And that's became the unofficial theme song for the show. Right. Just this, you know, song about this woman singing about B-movies. Right. And I... Uh, but I never thought about making it Rocky Horror themed yeah. in the slightest. I just thought it's the science fiction double feature, you know? Mm. So, so I, like, uh, we started chasing venues that we were going to use for it. And uh, the first initial venue that we were going to use was Counting House upstairs. Mm. We had people that worked in the Counting House. I used to work in the pub that we're in mm. right now. So I had easy access to get that venue. Well, you know, with. I just nipped up there about an hour ago. Yeah. Because uh, uh, Doug said to me, well, you're going to ask to see if Mark's up there? Yeah. Uh, you know Mark. No yeah, I do, yeah. Uh, he goes, yeah, go up, see if you can set up. I wasn't sure if we we're going to do it here or do it there. Yeah. Well, there was there were people line dancing up there. Yeah. They were line dancing you up there. You can use that room for anything. It's a great room. And I started doing stand up in the kitchen mm. as well. So we had the date booked for it. And um, it was there. And then something fell through and we had to get out of using it. And I had to think, where could we go to take this show? Because Banshee. we need a venue. Banshee. And then, I f and then I fought Banshees because for two reasons. One, me and Des did a show with a guy called Colm Finn. And uh, the show was called Colm Finn and Friends, and for a week, me, Des, and Colm would just do comedy and banshees. And we had some of the most fun and had some of the best gigs we've ever had. Me and Des quickly fell in love with that venue hmm. to the point where we were just like, damn, this is a great venue. I'd like to yeah. use it again. And also, Doug had his premiere of his film there. He had his premiere of his film there, which was a great premiere. Um, and then we had. Uh, I, so when the, uh, and then of course for the marketing for the show alone seeing two shows about Ghost and what is considered the most haunted venue in Edinburgh mm -hmm. it seems like a smart idea to take it mm. to Banshees so I approached, Des, I approached Richie that works at Banshees and says look I'm in a tight spot I need a venue for a show that I want to do in April would you be up for practice here and Banshees staff they were very nice to us during the fringe and he says we'd love to have you here we got it I told Des we're over the moon and we started working from there ever since mm. so it's yeah. yeah, it's the um, it's the quintessential venue for something like that, uh, you know, for, for that kind of theme. Even I I couldn't help but thinking even when uh, Doug's film was premiere, I'm thinking, well, it's quite dark film, quite dark subject matter. It's perfect for this place. Yeah, I didn't know uh, I'd been in there a couple of times for a couple of drinks, a couple of times for a couple of drinks, and I didn't know they had a full movie theater in there. Yeah, it's amazing. It's it's, and the downstairs part, yeah, it's, it's like it's like it's dungeon. a beautiful venue. It's crazy. It's a yeah. beautiful room. Yeah, like. Uh, it's almost got that same basement feel of a lot of good comedy yeah. places. Like you have to have a good basement for mm. a good. They've been in the caves across yeah, the road. Yeah, it's, it's similar. Like, They're all the vaults. Like yeah, like we could have taken it to any of those places, but we thought Banshee's good because it's we, like that. That it's reliable, and again, they've yeah. been so nice to us. Let's take it to Banshee. So, so your show itself is it going to be similar to this? For example, I saw Des O'Gorman's show, uh, Ghostbusters. Uh, still ready to believe you. Yes. Still ready to believe you. Still. still yeah, yeah. 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 I got it right. And he had a he had a screen behind him, yeah. And he was he was flipping through slides, but he also had the night I saw him. He didn't actually have his backpack. No, he wore his t-shirt that mm -hmm. night. And I was he wore his t-shirt every day. I saw Des every day almost yeah. of the festival because he was in the Hill Street Theater, yeah. where I was doing referendum TV, yeah, which was brutalizing. <laughs> I was basically working. I don't know if you ever told you about this. Carry I was the working story, for a a pro yes political sort of front for the yes campaign I was the only no voter on the set and on the crew and every day I would go through to the uh, the cafe Carry and Des would be behind the counter um, and, and every day I saw him he looked more and more worn out yeah but well, he'd always have his Ghostbusters t-shirt on well he wore his jumpsuit before. he wore his Ghostbusters jumpsuit uh, for the first few nights of the show and he was enjoying wearing that for a while but then he got like, started to smell so he took imagine. it off to get clean to wear that suit and I, I wore my suit for one night after I was doing a gig there and um, you know but like he wore the t-shirt he's going to be fully wearing his Ghostbusters outfit for this show mm. I guarantee you that because um, he's, he's had it dry cleaned ready to go yeah yeah like he dry cleaned it again and uh, 
Right, he's ready to go. He's got a new suit now. He's got a new proton pack. He's got a new ghost trap. He's really got it all planned out for this. Essential time. equipment. Yes, exactly. You, I don't go anywhere without my proton pack. Damn straight. You never know when a ghost is going to appear. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so let's move on uh, because... You have that coming up on the second, and that's yeah. running. I think you said it, but can you repeat it? How many th three nights? It's running? Just, no, it's, it's just a one, night one run. It's a it's one, a off one off standalone night. show. The plan is right. If the night is successful, Touchwood, we'll have it back again. Yes. And if it's successful, everyone else will have it back there again. Yes. As well. uh, at the at the moment, we're just looking forward to doing the one night and having a great night of it because essentially this night is for charity. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're wanting to raise funds for charity and like give a good cause mm. for a good day and for yeah. people that deserve it and stuff mm -hmm. so we're which particular charity is the money going to uh, autism initiatives Scotland. okay yeah yeah okay yeah. It's a subject very close to my heart yes so, I can uh, imagine yeah um, we're gonna get donate money to them and be thankful for them and stuff like that as well as just having a great night yeah and also it gives me a night to sort of test the show mm. because it's you know like I say it's my first mm. time doing a solo well, I have a, I have a mental uh, snowball in my head that's cascading down the hill of my mind and I'm thinking imagine a science fiction show where you have like a plethora of different people uh, doing different movies back to back at like 10 to 15 minutes a piece for two hours Can you imagine something like that I just just popped it in my head just now you know one person's doing uh, 2001 a space odyssey or something and someone yeah. else is doing Beetlejuice, just someone else is doing Ghostbusters uh, you know, that's that's a crazy idea I know that that'd be Des's thing he'd want to do a comedy yeah. based around films comedy because, montage yeah. of horror slash science fiction based films well not, not even just that just films in general yeah like uh, Des really wants to do a, a film night like in the poet soon and he really wants to get that off the ground mm. uh, and I, I volunteered to say I want to do a night where you talk about a film you love and I want to talk about my love for the original Evil Dead because it's my favourite horror film and he said that if we can find the time for it we will uh, I don't know what his plans are with that yet but uh, we'll wait and see yeah and so in terms of post science fiction double feature coming in the summer and you got the festival coming up I saw you last year at the festival you were at somewhere in the Cowgate name which escapes me was it Underbelly? it was the Cowgate Head um, the cow, the cow's yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was cow's head, wasn't it? No, it was the cowgate head because it was right next door to the cow shed. Right. And it was the new. It was a freestyle venue, mm. and I was doing an open spot there before going off to do. Everything is cake. agriculture and and animal related in the cowgate. Everything. If it's not yeah. underbelly, or they're calling it other belly, they're calling it the cow's head. It's. I think they've taken the joke as far as they can take it at the well, cowgate. It's, it's <laughs> themed. It's just themed. That's how it is. Yeah. Like, you the know. denizens of the cowgate. Yeah. So like, you kind of. You kind of have to go along with what they want to decide for it. So, I did the uh, I did the Ops one. I was doing Dizzy Gig. Then we did our week run at Banshees, which was some of the most fun I've ever had in mm -hmm. a long time. And I didn't catch that, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was an incredible night. I was mm -hmm. making something like thirty pound a night from that show. That's got to be great. Cause that's yeah. professional comedy. You getting paid for it? It's professional. Yeah. Well, it just it sort of sparked my love for why I do it again. Like I mean, I never lost the love for it, but just that sort of damn you're really getting this fire going now and have you gone through sort of uh, have you waxed and waned have you had ebbs and flows in terms of your enthusiasm never never, never. you've I, never had it you've never had a couple of months where you've where things haven't been happening because I want to talk about it from well, the perspective of people who are creative you're a creative person yeah, yeah. and it can be very difficult sometimes oh it can be it like, can be very demotivating and I, know I think that's can. an important thing to discuss because other people listening to this who are in a similar boat whether they're musicians or they're visual artists you know graphic designers everyone has that I think well, um, the only thing that demotivized me the most from doing anything about this was when I started working at a hospital, I was not properly doing stand-up for 10 months and it destroyed me. Yes. And I hated it. Now, that job, I quit it for different reasons other than obviously the big main ones. So when I quit, I've now been yeah. trying to get back into what it is that I'm doing now, mm. hence why this Beatles' show is really yeah. taking off. And there's off something and you kind of have to put all the bullets in the chamber and just start firing when it comes to what you want to do, what your ambitions are. Because I heard there's a great line. Someone will say, I'll get this job or I'll do this thing as a fallback. You know, or I'll study this thing as a fallback. Someone says, a fallback is a trap. Yeah. A fallback is a trap. A fallback is the thing that sucks the motivation out of your real aim and your real direction yeah. you want to go in. Well, and you start to rationalize the reasons that you're not doing it. You go, well, I have work. I have this thing yeah, to do. And, yeah, and I didn't you know, want that for myself anymore because I knew yeah. that if I started out doing something that I was predominantly strong in, yeah. that I want to keep doing it. And I know mm. that I get a lot of joy out of that than watching poor people die every day. Like that was, I didn't want that anymore. So I decided to get out of it. And now that I've done that, I'm now back to that point where I'm at my old job where I'm no longer like, 
I'm there for two hours a day. I've got plenty of time to think to myself and do anything like that. I'm not I'm not losing my creativeness in there. Uh, I'm organising gigs for myself, getting myself down to Glasgow again to gig down there, just to get that fire burning again. Yes, it's what I want it's, to it's do. It's like a lawnmower. You just got to have the momentum. You know, yeah. like the Latin momentum. Just keep it going. Keep yeah. going. Don't stop. Well, like I mean, you if know. at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Exactly. That sort of thing. Like you know, Robert the Bruce saw that when he saw that spider kept on. Yeah, trying to make he was in the so, cave. Yeah. It's yeah, a, and like. You, you, you can only do that and yeah. like, you look back at history there are a lot of stories about people having revelations in caves you look back and it's, it's guys in caves all the time guys yeah. in caves it's like a litany it's like a it's like a beat that runs through history like a I don't know what it is about caves but people seem to realize well, things about you know, themselves and the world in caves I don't know, you're, a cave you're, sh- you're shut away from the rest mm. of the world you've got nothing there and like you only have time to think to yourself and in that time what are you going to think about but you're going to think about something that's you know involving you you have that moment as that poetic irony yeah. as well because if you think prehistory caveman you go back to the you go back to where it all started and yeah. that's where you find the truth yeah. it's almost like some cheesy poem but it's, it's not it's just it's, like I, I, I understand that meaning now like mm. um, obviously I have a weird outlook on life and I don't really talk about it much because like, it's just sort of like, I, I start to see the simpler things about how people go they were locked away in themselves they came that how did it it's just simple because they were away from distractions uh, Jerry Seinfeld um one of the things that I learned from him that inspired my sort of style of comedy was that he would lock himself away in a like a library or a small desk room that he has with no TV, no phones, no internet, no computers, no radio, and he would just start writing. Mm. And he would be there for hours and then just writing, writing, writing. And from that, he would get jokes, he would write things down. And th- this is Jerry Seinfeld. His material is crack. Yeah. So I started testing out that theory to myself, like... Uh, when I had to, write, I've written three drafts of Beetlejuice. Yeah. The first draft is 19 pages. The second draft is 24 pages. The third and final draft, probably, is 25 pages. You know that. You know that when you're writing drafts, you're supposed to be decreasing the material <laughs> every time. Well, it's not even that you're decreasing material. Like, it's, it's not really about decreasing. Like, yeah. If you're, in terms of like scripts mm. and stuff, decrease. Yeah. In terms of stand-up. So there's a definite difference there yeah, in, there in is stand-up. Yeah. Like, uh, it's not, uh, in stand-up, I don't agree with the page a minute rule. Right. Because I've written like five pages of material that I think is not going to be five minutes. turns out to be ten. Yeah. You know, I've written three pages of simple one-liners, and that takes up four and a half Exactly. Minutes. You don't take into account the, the responsiveness of the audience. I mean, if the audience love it, then you've got to yeah. account for applause, yeah. possibly standing applause yeah. in between each joke. So... But for 25 minutes, I, I've written 25 pages, and that has came to ultimately the 45 minutes yeah. of the run that I want to do. You so have to factor breathing into it and the rest of it. You well, got to breathe in between the jokes. It's, 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 <laughs> you know. Well, it's like trying to find the space. I mean, I'm not deliberately going to tell the joke and just stand there and go, mm. "Well, time to laugh." I'm just gonna, like, you have to ride it. Like it's like mm. surfing. You just have to ride the wave so you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know you were going. I mean, do you go into every festival? Because I mean, it's what we've said this before, but. Being a stand-up comic in Edinburgh, it's 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 different from a lot of other cities because we have a, a, a comedy and arts festival that's the biggest one in the world. So every year, it's that thing where you're like, well, the festival's coming up. Every comic in Edinburgh and even outside Edinburgh across the country and the world is thinking, a lot of them anyway, okay, the Edinburgh Festival, the Fringe is coming up. I'm, I'm going to get into it. Every year, is your view of the Fringe going in? Are you more confident? Are you less confident than you were the year before? I would say I get more and more excited about it. I get more and more to the point of this. Like, a Marine going into battle. Just yeah. like, let's do this. Yeah, you're Pure- a veteran of the Fringe. You've well, seen it all. Yeah, like, yeah. Seen, like uh, even that, like, I, I wouldn't even call it a veteran. Like, when you perform in it enough and you do it enough, you sort of, you grow to love it. Like, I mean, I still love the Fringe and I've done it twice now. Like, uh, I made the documentary and people were coming up to me in the street like well, like people I knew were going dude I watched it why didn't you just fucking sleep yeah. and I was going I didn't have time to sleep I just yeah. had to keep going and I did it again last year mm. when I was currently working at a hospital as well yeah. so I was really exhausted for all of it but I kept going and I'd mm. done it and I had more fun doing that I didn't tell anybody what I was doing because this is what I wanted to do mm. and every festival I, I just I pick up what I'm going to say, I know what I'm going to do, and I'm just there, and I'm going, let's do this. Exactly, and that's Ross Hepburn and Doug Fender's Fringe Survival Guide, which is, I think, now about a year and a half old, but so you can find it in the description of this video, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, for those of you who are interested. See what, what, what the machinations and the craziness that is the Edinburgh Fringe. I mean, the continuous day after day after day, especially if, like someone like yourself, you've got a busy schedule and you're, you're doing a lot of different gigs, it's still, it's got to be an exhilarating couple of weeks, because it's just 
so many things happening all at once you feel like you're having it is like the last sequence of 2001 a space odyssey but I, bright I, colors in your face all the time just morphing into different things and the scenery changes but the atmosphere remains more or less the same but i wouldn't have it any other way mm. like if it was quiet i would be very disappointed yeah if i was not doing anything i'd be very disappointed yeah i would rather have the hectic lifestyle of doing like five gigs a day to different people every day to different hours of the day I, like really waking up at like seven o'clock in the morning to do to finish a gig and then finish that last gig at five o'clock in the morning to yeah. have two hours sleep to do the next gig again i love that that would be that that is for me a true pat like that's renegade comedy for me yeah i would i love doing that that's how i would never have it uh just to work just working every day being busy to like that's what like the thing that I try and get across when I did the French talking about was that this was what I was doing. This is what I loved doing, and I could not emphasize that enough when mm -hmm. I was doing it at the time. And I still feel that way. Yeah. Uh, doing gigs again, like I did a gig in uh, Yes Bar in Glasgow, and that was one of the funnest gigs I've ever done in my life. I've done a gig in like my first gig of the year was in here, and I just love it. Like. Yeah. I just have a great love for just mm. going out my way. Your first you know, ever gig was was technically here, or was it where you were built? I mean. Technically uh, here. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, I models years ago. Nah, and and we're, we're, we're getting nostalgic, but I'm sure yeah. that you, you did small things and models that were kind of unofficial. Unofficial things, yeah. just me. just Because I joke. think the first I, time someone ever, I think it was Kelly, came up to me. You know Ross is doing stand-up comedy? Yeah. And it was like that story you told earlier. I went, of course he is. Yeah, that, yeah, makes, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it doesn't surprise me that no matter who I... like, I could bump into old friends from like school from years ago, and they'll just still say, so we hear you doing comedy now. We knew that it happened to you. And I went, well, you, you ever bumped in any of them while doing comedy and you come out and they're like, oh, it looks fucking Ross. Okay. No, thank God. That'd be an um, interesting experience, well, like, you know. I, this is a growing pain for me as a comedian now, yeah. especially since I've done it and now I've got friends of mine that try and get cut back in contact with me after five years of not talking to them, but they just go, oh man, you'll have to invite your student to come see you when you do stand up and every time you do, they don't turn up. Yeah. Well, you see, what? I'm, I'm bad for that, but I don't turn up to anything at the time that I'm supposed to because I'm always... Except for tonight, when yeah. I was early. But, um, but that's exactly why I'm never early for anything. Yeah. So like, this year, going into the festival, your plan is what? I mean, how, what are you thinking for the I festival? I have no idea. No, you're just no, winging like, it? Are, no. you, are you writing material specifically well, for like, it? Is it a combination is, of the other the stuff? The plan is, if this show is a success, and I'll turn it into a French show, hmm. as well as do open spots on the side, that's all I want to do. Um, sorry. That's okay. And if I'm not successful doing that, then I'll do it next year. Mm. Uh, purely because I think um, you're, you're going to be at the show, aren't you? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Well, like, when, when you're there for that and the show is received well enough, like, I mean, I've spoken, like, I did a preview show for it here, and I only invited four people to the show. Just of your segment of the show? Just of my segment of the show, right? I was just test I had to test out my 45 minutes to see if it was worth a show and stuff like that, and I, and I invited people that I trust their opinions on. Like, these weren't people who were going, oh my god, that was so funny, man! How did you do it? It was people that would go, that's good. Here's what you can do differently. Those sort of people. Yes. Those are the Feedback people. Feedback is so yeah, important. Yeah. Feedback so is so important. so important. So I invited an audience mm -hmm. of four people, which is the best for tell for testing new jokes. Mm. Uh, it may not be a good comedy gig, but when you're testing new material, four people are the most honest people you'll ever uh, mm. will ever tell you about jokes and stuff like that. So I did this gig to uh, a few people that I trust and respect and admire. By the end of the show, they came up to me afterwards and said, "Don't change anything. That yeah. was great." Please they don't loved change it. Me. They yeah. loved it. Like, and they weren't drunk. You totally you, weren't you, drunk. That's good. Okay. One was drunk, but he was an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. So he's okay, used to, so he's always drunk. Yeah. yeah so the, like, you know, if you be, caught him sober, you'd be very dubious exactly, of the accuracy like, of his claims. What the fuck is wrong with you? Anyway, um, so I, I, I got that response. And then, like, it got to the point where even Des Gorman, my good friend and colleague, my the guy I opened for, for his show, looked to me and said, this show's better than mine. Great, great comic, and I'm going to be having him on the show hopefully yeah. over the next couple of months, so yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the long-term plan, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, is to have you, both you and Dez yeah. on the show. Um, and also, I obviously had Doug Fender on the show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and that show will be out at some point in the future. I hope so. I want to hear he, has a, he has a film he's working on right now called Stray Dog. Stray Dog, yeah. I've and read the script for it. I fantastic. assume that both you and Dez, I, I think Dez... Specifically, uh, Doug mentioned that he wanted Dez in it. Dez, uh, both you Dez, and Dez. Dez is going to be in it. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug is writing me a cameo. Yeah. Uh, now that me and Doug don't really make films together yeah. anymore, he's happy to give me like a five-minute cameo. Yeah. Just like, as a little, a little. Well, you see, Doug's making the film. Dez is going to be playing a major part in the film, and so I want to have you, Doug, and Dez, on the show, 
Des filmmaker, uh, sorry, uh, Doug filmmaker, Des actor, and you giving uh, feedback and commentary on the way that you've seen the process of the film developing. That is definitely an idea that I want to exercise at some point in the future because it allows me, gives me a cheap excuse to use all three of my microphones simultaneously, yeah. which will be a challenge in and of itself. So, well, when do you usually find out about which dates you're playing, which venues you're playing for a comic? In your position, there are a lot of other people like uh, that do sit, that are at a similar level as you. You know, they're they're comics. They've been doing it for a good couple of years. When do when do you people usually find it? You people. When do you usually find out what you're playing and where you're playing it? You just have to ask, really. Yeah. Like it's all a matter of luck. You really just have to ask. You don't have stuff lined up from last year where you no. you know you're going to be coming back to do no. something similar. No. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. Yeah, ha- it's much like anything that's in the creative arts business. It's all self-employed. You find out on the day when you ask. Uh, when I asked for the gig in Glasgow, I ma- uh, messaged the guy Graham Barry, who is the most pro motherfucker on the planet. Like I was amazing. Like the guy was just worthy of fist bumps all the time. I've never came across as somebody as pro as him. And I messaged him saying, "Hi, my name is Ross Hepburn. I'm a comedian based in Edinburgh. I'm looking for gigs to do in Glasgow, and I was wondering if I could get me up for a slot." He messaged me back saying, "Sure, Ross, love to have you on. Uh, we'll get you on for this day. Mm. Uh, you know, are you, are you comfortable with that?" I went, "Yep, yeah, that's fine. Good." Well, yeah, and you want to film as many things as possible because you can build a portfolio that you can go. Here's a little clip of my stuff on YouTube. Sign me up for tonight. Yeah, it, it's something like that. Yeah. I mainly film it back. Uh, the social media revolution. That's how well, it works. Well, it's not even that. Because like, uh, I'll get onto social media, uh, the revolution for a second in comedy uh, when I talk about the event for the show. Mm. But um, I, uh, I decided to film all my sets because I saw. Uh, do, do you, are you interested in American football at all? Do you like? Not particularly. Football? It's a little too stop start for my taste. Right. Okay. Well, there's an American football player. I forget his name, but my mate TD told me about him. But all he, what he would do is, no matter what game he was playing, say it be a home game or a small game or a big game, he would always film his sets. He would always film his games, and then he would go back, rewatch what it is that he'd done, learn from it, and do it for the next game. Or yeah. Like do it for that. So I decided to film my sets, not really to sort of use it for social media terms and use it for my YouTube channel, purely just to film myself. So that say I, I do a throwaway line, I get a good laugh. I'll film myself. Going you take a note of it. Yeah. And you, I, you tweak it where necessary. Yeah. I, I kind of. It, it, it's sort of like when I film, I've filmed the 45 minute preview show yeah. that I've done. And right, I've, okay. And I've learned that over and over uh-huh. again just so I could get Are that you planning on filming the preview. science fiction double feature? <sighs> there, there was talk of it. Yeah. And there was talk of it, but obviously in filmmaking terms, it's so complicated to find out what to do, you know? Yeah. Because realistically, we're going to be in a room that's really small and we're going to need multi camera access to cater for filming the, 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 the stage, the comedians, the crowds for reactions, uh, and also getting multi-shots to make sure it's all fine. It's not like, I think if I was to organize something now, it would be pulling a hair syndrome sort of thing. So yeah. uh, what we have instead, like, you know, I'm, uh, what I'm trying to focus on right now is just getting the show done. Yes. I'm not worried about filming it. Uh, I think further on down the line, if I was to do another night, we'll film it then. Yes. You know, but for for this night, we're just going to premiere. You want to focus on the content. I just want to. You don't want on anything the... to detract from the content. Yeah. I mean, hell, you could just you could set up an omnidirectional microphone and just record the whole thing. Well, like I do. Yeah. I've, I've done that before in the past. Yeah. I've done like I filmed my set at the uh, at the S bar, mm. my little fifteen minute segment, and I was all filmed on my handy cam. Mm. I filmed that. That was that was the camera that yeah. I used during the I mean, finish. I mean, it's it's. A standard microphone that's going to pick up a lot sounds bad if what you're going for is entertainment that you want to show people. Yeah. But the omnidirectional one also allows you to capture the crowd's response. It, it three-dimensionalizes. You get every, a bit yeah. of everything, so you have a real idea of how it went down. Because when you're in the heat of the moment, obviously, you don't me- you don't yeah. realize it. And it's the same for, like, uh, Doug brought a GoPro to a gig in here once. Yeah. And a GoPro. Have you ever seen those things? Yeah, they're great. They're amazing. They're amazing. Like, they catch everything. Great sound, great quality. Like... This could be a new toy for mm. comedians but to help them out. Well, you know, like, I saw a GoPro attached to a, a, a helicopter drone. This guy flies it above the new Apple headquarters in California. Yeah. Where they're building their new headquarters. A massive button. Like, it looks like the button you see on iPods, the little round ones. Yeah. And he had it flying about 400 feet over this construction site. And the things you can do with a GoPro, you add a drone to that mix, it's devastating. But oh, for yeah. you, I mean, coming up for the festival, aside from phoning up and finding out yeah can I do tonight you also over the last couple of years and you've mentioned a couple of them um, have built up a, a network of c- uh, fellow comedians that you can say oh yeah you're doing that thing think they have a slot open for that you know yeah. and, and you can kind of network around with your group of uh, associates and colleagues I suppose uh, your peers you might say and that's got to be a great thing as well because it allows you to book things up really quickly so you're never bored no, I'm a never comedian bored. is never bored during the festival no, they're, they're tired they're, but they're never oh, bored oh they're never bored but they, they, they're, they're never like, they're exhausted but they're never bored mm. and that, that's I think that's the beauty of it you know 
uh, especially with the sort of network of friends that I've collected over the years in comedy. Like I've made some of the best friendships that I've ever had now through yes. this comedy circuit. Yes, it's it's as sour as any business. There's mm. no denying that. It's it's stupid to say that you're going to go into something and there's not going to be any poison. Yeah, because there's got to be poison. Yeah, there's but, assholes like, everywhere. Yeah, there is. But yeah. like you know, but like that that's the that's the nature of things. You yeah. can't have everything be perfect. There's always mm. going to be that one person. And there's something great. I mean, I definitely feel it with with uh, my studies, for example, where I'm studying media. It's great being in a room with a bunch of people at least 90% of whom love what you love yeah. and you can talk to them on that level and you can talk to them forever I mean he, I know someone that likes electronic cigarettes me and my friend Yanis he yeah. works at Emporium Vapor which is the biggest e-cig shop in the city whole chain of shops I could talk to this guy for hours and hours and hours just about electronic cigarettes yeah. and not be bored must be the same with you and someone like Dez you guys could just sit and just talk about comedy oh uh, your experiences forever. Yeah, like uh, we we could sit down and talk about loads of things. Uh, the last like comedy is one of the last things we talk about, to be honest, because like it's our day job. The last thing yeah. we want to talk about is a day at the office for us, you know. But uh, when we first met, we started talking films, as we always do. Yeah. As I like, I seem to find that uh, a lot of the conversations that I make with people are over films first, yeah. which I've got no bother with. Well, if you think about, it, we're kind of talking comedy because those films have gone directly into your shows. Yeah, so of everything course, yeah. is an influence. We you know? never knew that. At the it's time, all though, tied obviously. together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we never knew that at the time. But uh, we met up once. We went to have drinks in the Jekyll and Hyde. We started talking about films. It was fine. <laughs> then I tried to talk about the thing I'm passionate about, the thing I love, which is music. Yeah. I fucking love music. You love music. I'm a big music fan. I nerd. didn't figure you for like a huge music fan. Like I thought you you liked it, but I didn't. I didn't oh no, I'm a huge, I was brought up I with mean, music. I mean, I always so. assume that someone likes music. When I find out this, I, you know, you'll occasionally meet people and you go, what are you into musically? They're like, not really into music. Yeah. And you, and you stop and you go, and that's as far as the conversation goes. Yeah. You're like, what's wrong with you? See, I have to be careful whenever I space myself because like I tried sitting there with Dez and went, so Dez, uh, what kind of music? Have you heard this album? We went, what's that? Who done that album? Went, what do you mean who done that album? It was them? We went, oh. Yeah. Who done them? What? Are you, yeah, like, he's like Sherlock Holmes. He's, he's just one thing that he thinks about. He's yeah, like, you exactly. Know. And like nothing to take away from that. And now, and now I'm trying to help him get into music. Now, I've gave him a list of songs that he should listen. And now yeah. that's coming out of it. But yeah. like, I've kind of learned this sort of beauty that comes from being with people that don't have similar interests as yeah, you because absolutely. you can open their horizons yeah. to see what it is that they can mm -hmm. be into. There is a line like though. If they have no similar interests. The conversation is over, I find. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If there's but, nothing that you can bounce off to, to go to somewhere yeah. else, you know, um, uh, it becomes very difficult to have that conversation. So you're, you're going to be doing, just to wrap up now, oh, right, uh, you're going to be doing um, the science fiction double feature at the Banshee Labyrinth. It's £2 on the door. It's on the 2nd of April, 2015, in case you're listening to this. Uh, as, a, as part of a hologram recording and you're from the planet Z-Lob trying to if you ever upload find out what the fuck thing, happened to these monkeys if yeah. I ever upload it yeah. you, you're late on the upload once Doug yeah. right and he's, he's telling everyone about it yeah it will that that uh, that podcast will also come out eventually I hope the next so. couple of days I, I hope to see it next because, couple of days is what I hope I want to put it on the event page have you seen my event page for I the have, show oh yes yeah, yeah of course now I've learned one of the best tricks to keep people motivated and still inspired tell by us it. well like, I just just keep updating yeah like i've been uploading pictures and like videos and funny little segments that is all related about ghostbusters and beetlejuice mm. and i've had a lot of joy doing it because it's, it's opened in my eyes to see what there it is it gets there. people excited it, it, yeah. it, it regales yeah. them of the subject it really matter, does. which is important and um thank you very much for coming on the show man you're going to be playing on the second alongside Dezo's, Dezo gorman another great comment it's uh, maybe the show times maybe an hour and a half two hours Wait, something around that something like that like yeah. uh It'll two pounds. That's an uh, that's a pound an hour, ladies and gentlemen. For two shows. For exactly. two shows. But that's like fifty pence a show. Yeah. Like you, you, you can't like, you can't get better than that. Like there's, it's since it's in Banshee, there'll be good drinks there and stuff like that. But exactly. like, it's two shows back to back. Yeah. Both forty five minutes long each. Uh, I mean, I mean, your material minutes. aside, almost two pounds for Banshee just to walk into that venue. The venue alone that you're going to be playing in is amazing. Yeah, not so to mention place. the material and the tone and theme yeah. of the material. So it's, two pound, you have a great night. What kind of time is that starting at? It's, uh, it's half seven in the evening. Half seven on the and, second, two pound at the door. And finishes at half ten. And if you want to hang around and talk to me and Des after the show, you are more than welcome to. Mm -hmm. We're happy to talk to you. You're anybody. welcome to follow them home. Well, not even that. Like you're, you're happy to just follow me in general. Like, yeah. you know, good luck if you can find me. Fuck's sake. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for coming on the show, man. It's been thank awesome. Thank you for having me again. Yes, and you will be on again, no doubt, again. in the next couple of months. Thanks very wait. much. Thanks for listening, folks. Please, if you enjoyed this podcast, hit the like button. Uh, subscribe to my channel. Uh, subscribe to Ross's channel, which is Stand Up Ross. I haven't uploaded anything new in a while, but if you want to watch some, but old, you never know. You like, never know. If you want to see what me and Doug made 
years ago. Go ahead. Yeah, well, it's still a great channel. I still sometimes dip into that content from from now and then. It, quality has no age, Ross. Oh, I, no, I really do. It I really, really don't think like, it does. I'm the one thing I'm still proud of, proud of, proudest of the most on that channel is my American Psycho parody. Right. Uh, yeah, that's the, the the one about giving blood. Yeah. I will also link that in the description because I love that video as well. Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, it's. It's not not to say pretentious, but it's the best for yeah. my right. And now. it's Dezel Bo Gorman being killed. Yeah, I'm so killing him with an axe. If you, yeah, exactly. So if you and want some real crossover, for uh, so the two comedians you're going to be seeing on the second, uh, which you will go to, ladies and gentlemen, it's mandated now. And two you're going to be the door, half past seven in the evening on the second of April. Science fiction double feature. And you want to see Dez yeah. and I will be there as well. Yeah. You want to see Dez and Ross on screen at the same time and see Dez being killed by Ross with an axe. I think an axe is what you used. Yeah. Uh, as part of a drive to encourage people to give blood, uh, you can find that in the description below this video. Like, comment, subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, folks, and listening. Any last words, Ross? I have to say thanks very much for listening, folks, and I'll see you next time.